Where do we stand with COVID-19? It's almost September 2020. Well, let's start by what we know to be true, according to the official news. A virus started spreading in Wuhan, China, called the SARS-CoV-2, a coronavirus. China responded by locking down. They had victory in one month. The World Health Organization saw how well it worked for China. And as the virus spread, the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic advising governments the world over to do the same. Almost half the world shut down and is mostly still closed more than six months into the pandemic with no end in sight. People are instructed to follow common hygiene principles and wear masks. Stuff we never did and we never apparently washed our hands. People with weak immune systems are more likely to die from COVID-19. Uh, but nobody talks about strengthening the immune system. Masks have become mostly mandatory the world over. We wait for the virus to die so we can carry on with our lives. Millions of people lost their livelihoods and are dying of hunger, but we are confident that our government knows best how to protect us and one life saved from the virus cannot be measured against the destroying of the world economy. So, where are we then? To date, let's put COVID-19 in perspective. Currently, about 800,000 people died from COVID-19 the world over, so under a million. But in the same period, 800,000 plus died from car accidents. One million people died from HIV AIDS. Three million from smoking and 5 million died from cancer and these are just the big figures but this one is really important if you really wanted to save the uh, population of the world 30 million babies have been aborted to date in this same period so i want to tell you about a fairy tale i remember lying in bed as a child next to my granny when i was very young and she used to tell me the story of Little Red Riding Hood and the wolf. And, uh, you know, looking back, you can't really understand that she told you these horror stories, but she told me how dangerous the wolf was. She also told me that I couldn't go, out as, um, uh, go outside because the wolf would get to me. And when a neighbor died, she told me that it was the wolf. And because, you know, I was young, I believed her. She even showed me the footprints of the wolf in the garden. She showed me the scratch marks on the doors of the, uh, you know, of the wooden doors and said these were the wolves. Looking back, I cannot believe, like I say, she told me these horror stories, but of course it was all a fairy tale. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, there were no wolves, um, especially in South Africa. The neighbor died of a heart attack. And yes, um, the scratches and the scratch marks on the door, that was from cats and the, and the marks in the garden, of course, those were just simply made by dogs running around. The point is that we are being told that the SARS-CoV-2 that causes the COVID-19 um, is dangerous, but it is actually a fairy tale. Well, how can I say that? Well, if you're interested in the facts, stay tuned. If not, this is the point where you stop the video and say this, to this guy is a total idiot or a conspiracy theorist. So, if you're still wanting to continue, I thought I would answer some questions that people have about the pandemic and maybe that will make it clear. So, one is, will I get the virus? And the answer to this is probably yes. And the chances are very high that um, you already had it just like you had it last year. How serious is the virus then is another question. Well, less serious than TB, HIV, malaria, and of course abortions, because 99.99% .99 of people survived the virus, just like last year. Well, why are there so many people dying then? And what are they dying from? Well, are there many people dying? That's my question. Okay. Well, first of all, I agree that uh, deaths 
you cannot easily fake a death and a death is counted as a death. So a death is a death. And so you have to look at deaths and, but you cannot, you have to look at all cause mortality deaths. You have to look at all cause mortality data on a per week or per day basis, because that's reliable. If you try to assign a cause of death in a complicated situation like this with a viral respiratory infection that uh, taxes your immune system and, and you die if you have comorbidity conditions, to try to unravel that is it's known. Epidemiologists have known this forever <laughs> since, since, the, since the discipline started that you, 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 you can't reliably do that. And there's tremendous sources of bias. and There always have been in terms of assigning deaths in the middle of an epidemic. So you don't do that. You look at all cause mortalities. And so I counter question can be, if the virus was so deadly, why do the World Health Organization and the CDC tell and instruct doctors to put COVID-19 or COVID-19 as the cause of death, even if they only suspect and haven't tested for deaths? Uh, and don't consider comorbidities like a weak heart or cancer or things like that. So the language um, was changed. The words from, with, related all became the same thing, if you follow what I'm saying in the media. So why has the global death rate not gone up if this virus is so deadly and out of the ordinary? That's why the focus moved from deaths to cases because they couldn't get the deaths and that's why they had to fake the numbers so much. Now the question of course is, but we see hospitals are overflowing, right? Well, the catastrophic predictions were inflated by, in some cases, up to a factor of 5,000 because it's an ordinary flu that there are no more sick people this year and deaths this year than there were in previous years in peak flu season. So again, in peak flu season, the hospitals were overcrowded. And, but we are shown on television what the mainstream media wants us to see. Another question is, are masks effective? Well, if masks work, why can we they not reopen everything? And if they don't, then why wear them? The answer is no, masks are not effective in any way to slow the spread of any virus. And uh, I can simply put it to you like this. If, if um, let's put it crudely, if I fart and you can smell the uh, fart through your mask, how will it stop a smaller than fart viral particle getting into your body? So I'll put the link below. There's uh, an interview with uh, Professor Dennis Rancourt, and he looked at all the mask studies. Not a single shred of evidence showed that any mask work in any way whatsoever. The vast majority of the population uh, believes in masks and has now actually, ch ch initially they weren't, but because of all this messaging that's been going out over the last few months, uh, you are essentially vilified if you are seen in the public, most public places now without a mask, and you will not be able to fly without a mask, and you won't be able to take an Uber or a Lyft without a mask. So the consensus of the public is firmly in favor of masks. I've written papers on microbial interactions in the environment, uh, important papers that have been well cited. So I know a lot of different areas of science. I'm a very interdisciplinary person and I've uh, published over 100 scientific articles in leading uh, peer-reviewed journals. And I immediately started researching uh, the, the epidemiology and the virology of this thing and reading the papers as they came out and then seeing how there was a big emphasis on masks, I became interested in that. So I did a very thorough study of uh, the scientific literature on masks and I concentrated on is there any evidence that masks can be of help in terms of reducing the risk of getting one of these viral respiratory diseases. And what I found is when I looked at all the randomized controlled trials with verified outcome, meaning you actually measure whether or not the person was infected, um, I found that there were none of these uh, uh, well-designed studies that are intended to remove any bias, any observational bias. Out of all of the many trials that were done, none 
found that there was a statistically significant advantage for this application to wearing a mask versus not wearing a mask. And likewise, there is no detectable difference between respirators and uh, uh, surgical masks. So uh, that to me was a clear sign that the science was telling us that they could not detect a, a positive utility of masks in this application. And so we're talking many really uh, quality trials. And so what, what this means, this is very important because what it means is that, you see, if there was any significant advantage to wearing a mask to reduce this risk, then uh, you would have detected that in at least one of these trials. And there's no sign of it. So that to me is a firm scientific conclusion. There is no evidence that masks are of any utility, either preventing um, the, the aerosol particles from coming out or from going in. You know, you're not helping the people around you by wearing a mask and you're not helping yourself preventing the disease by wearing a mask. The science is unambiguous in that such an effect, positive effect, cannot be detected. The link is there if you want to look at it. So what is the current state of South Africa? Because that's what we are concerned. Well, around 20,000 South Africans died from uh, influenza and pneumonia in 2016. In 2014, more than 23,000 died. So far this year, according to the official data, influenza has been virtually non-existent, as has the RSV, another pathogen that causes flu-like symptom. Meanwhile, the number of COVID cases has just gone through the roof. So it's the same figures. So it's just a redesignation of an old virus. So, so far in South Africa, around 12,000 people have died of COVID-19. About the same number of deaths we usually see from the influenza and pneumonia each year. So, the question is, have we been lied to? Well, you know the frog in the frying pan, slowly. Yes, only 21 days lockdown. Here we are six months later. And the media keeps blowing fear-mongering and control. And all the media, it doesn't matter which one you listen to, is one message. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of biased and false, false news, news has, has become, become all too, too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same stories without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 So I want to talk to you about Wetiko, a sort of psychological virus that infests the brain and it's a, a, the subconscious brain and it, it convinces the conscious brain uh, that it is not blind to things that goes around. And, but in fact, the virus has infected the brain and it is blinded but you believe you're not blind what do i mean by that i often hear people and they 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 acknowledge that the whole virus thing is nonsense what we're being put through is absolute nonsense and then a minute later they say oh but the virus is is dangerous and we should have locked down the country earlier and yes people are dying from it what that means is they they give back the mainstream media narrative. They don't think for themselves. So they, we have really lost critical thinking. And that is what Wetika does. It convinces the mind that it is in fact, it knows what's going on when in fact it really doesn't. And you see that all around. We certainly see it all around. So here are some real answers. The virus was never isolated. How can I say that? Dr. Andrew Kaufman did a forensic analysis on the studies that proved that SARS-CoV-2 causes COVID-19. 
not a single documented study to this date has isolated the so-called SARS-CoV-2 and linking it to COVID-19. Because up until now, uh, we are using the idea that this is a virus that has swept the nation. Maybe it was here earlier than we thought. The numbers aren't what we see, but there does seem to be some dangers when it gets into nursing homes, all of those things. You are actually questioning whether or not COVID-19 exists at all. Am I correct about that? Or please clarify your position. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, that's pretty close. So I just want to uh, separate the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is what they've named what they call as a virus, and COVID-19 being the illness. Okay. So I actually reject uh, both uh, hypotheses. Um, and But I don't want to come across as saying that I deny that there were people dying during, the, during this mortality spike from late March until May. I just uh, have different explanation for what resulted in those deaths. But what I've done from the beginning, once I noticed that there was some uh, fishy things going on in the policies of how they were handling this pandemic because it was divergent from any past policies that I'd ever been familiar with, I went and looked at the papers that had claimed to isolate this virus, and uh, there are essentially four papers. And um, when I read these, I uh, read them very closely, and I had to, you know, do some investigation because they use kind of a, a lot of language that's difficult to understand unless you're publishing in this field. So it took me a bit to parse out exactly what they did, but what I found out is that they never isolated or purified a virus. So what I mean is, in order to identify a virus, it's basically a particle, right, that has a membrane and inside of it some genetic material and a few proteins uh, throughout. And so in order to identify that, what you would do is that you would basically purify it from a sick person, uh, from the disease part of their body. In this case, they took samples from lung fluid because the uh, people that they identified as having this illness uh, had respiratory symptoms. But they never actually purified any viral particles out of that lung fluid or out of their tissue culture experiments later on. Instead, what they did is they amplified a piece of genetic material that had a part of its sequence that they were specifically looking for because they had pre-identified these sequences as being from viruses. And they just basically identified a snippet of this genetic material and said that this was a virus. And they did really nothing more. So there was never a particle that was purified um, from which they would extract genetic material and say, this RNA came from this particle. Therefore, it belongs to the particle and it makes up a basically genome of a virus. If they wanted to go a step further and prove that such a virus would cause an illness, what they would have to do is then put that virus particle in a healthy host and then show that that host develops the same disease. And those are called Koch's postulates. And that's right. basically the common sense rules which the germ theory scientists originally formulated themselves to prove if a, a germ or pathogen causes an illness. And this was never done either. And this has far reaching implications because the test, the main test that's been used, the RT-PCR test that I'm sure you've talked about at length yeah. is based on this little piece of RNA that we don't know where it comes from because it came from this lung fluid, which has many, many things in it, many sources of RNA, DNA, many different kinds of cells, including human and microbial. And we also know that many what they call viral sequences have been found in our own cells and particles that our own cells make, uh, known as exosomes, in the past. So it could very well be that this RNA is from our own cells, from exosomes, or it could be from another microbial source. We just have no idea of telling where it was because they never found the particle that it came from and took it from that particle. And there's a new article that came out uh, written by uh, Torsten Engelbrecht, uh, where he actually emailed the authors of these four papers and asked them directly um, did you show any evidence of a purified virus? And all four of them answered that they did not purify any viral particles. So they're essentially admitting that they don't know the origin of the genetic material. So, so what are they then testing for? Well, they're using a PCR test and the inventor, Kerry Mullis, for which he received a Nobel Prize, said, 
this test should not be used for diagnosing infectious diseases, which is exactly what's happening the world over now. Uh, what are they then finding when they're doing a positive test? Well, um, they find genetic material you and I can have and it find in any human with comorbidities, compromised immune system, so-called, and that thing is called an exosome. It's basically material that your body excretes when it's under severe immune pressure. So if you make the test sensitive enough, every single human being on earth could be shown positive for a virus that was never isolated by a test that does not test for a virus. The head of um, Ezinstha at Wits University, Professor Francois Fenter, says testing for COVID-19 is a waste of time, money and hospital resources, one of our own esteemed scientists. What are people dying then from? I mean, if this isn't true, well, what did people die from in the previous years? It's the same illnesses, but a new test. So illnesses on the past have been redesignated as, as a new illness now. Seems like we've forgotten the people that died in the previous years and how many deaths we had and how the hospitals are constantly overpopulated uh, here and, for instance, in Britain. Why don't doctors speak out then, is another question. Well, many doctors have discovered the hoax early in the lockdown and many have been shut down or deleted from places like Facebook and YouTube and Twitter. Uh, who? Well, these are people like Dr. Dan Erickson. He had a very fantastic news interview. Dr. Kaufman, which said it wasn't isolated. There was an ER doctor um, from New York that said he doesn't understand what's happening and he asked for help. And then, of course, Dr. Stella Emanuel. Dr. Stella Emanuel, of course, was uh, blocked from the internet and she said uh, she treated 350 patients herself with hydroxychloroquine, zinc and azithromycin, and she hasn't lost a single one. <clears throat> now, you would think that if some doctor comes up with a cure that the world wants to know about it because it's about saving people, right? Well, the contrary has shown to be uh, the case. And the fact checkers of uh, Facebook and of uh, Twitter and Instagram and YouTube, they know better than the scientists, right? So if anything goes according uh, against what the World Health Organization says, the ones that was defunded by America, uh, then it's censored. Well, it's censored not because they want you to know the truth, of course. But my local doctor says it's really bad. He closed down and he told me to stay at home. Why does he then not know the facts? Well, although your doctor may be an intelligent and a good man or woman, the garden variety doctor hardly ever does any of their own research. Doctors are taught at medical school to obey and do uh, what the superiors say and contain the status quo. As seen by their superiors, uh, and that's the way it is. So the superiors wait to hear what the World Health Organization has to say, and our government and, and its doctors follow what the World Health Organization says. Of course, except Sweden. I mean, they kryptonite to the whole thing. Okay, but why would anyone want to do such a thing? I mean, why? Well, the One World Order wants to control you. They want to take away your individual freedom and liberty. They think they know what's best for you. Your government thinks they know what's best for you. What you need to learn, what you need to uh, at school, what you need to eat, drink, wear, and what you should do and where you can fly and travel and where you cannot. So it's about power and control. If you still don't see it, you're really naive or not paying attention. I don't say this lightly. I was one of the worst critics of the so-called conspiracy theorists. But it is no longer a theory, friends. If you don't know that, you haven't been paying attention. But how could they control the whole world is another question. Well, think of an uh, outlet like McDonald's. You don't need to phone every branch and every worker all over the world to change a recipe. You simply change it at the headquarters and the rest will follow suit. No questions asked. You don't need to control every person in, in every working branch. And that's how the pyramid scheme works. So the question then is, where is it all going? Well, the answer is 
what's happened the virus is a big scare lockdown we started the 21 days the media fear-mongering now six months later the merit narrative changes from deaths to cases and the media is fear-mongering. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their, their own personal bias. For the greater good, masks, no science is behind that. The media fear-mongering. To push, push their, their own personal bias. Contract tracing, where the president announced is going to happen. The media fear-mongering. To push their own personal bias. What's up next? Well, the COVID pass for the phones are coming. That's what the president announced. Your phone can still be tracked though, okay, but you can get rid of it, throw it in the ocean. So what, what will be next? We're not entirely sure though, but um, for the greater good, some form of biometric tracing uh, will come uh, into play. Australia is already talking about if you don't have the vaccine, you can't enter a restaurant, a train, a plane, school, etc., etc. So how will your local restaurant know if you had a vaccine that you are safe to enter or not? Are you going to carry a piece of paper? I doubt very much. So the next thing that will come, of course, is loss of freedom, liberty, etc. Control of the masses by the few. What can we do? Because that's ultimately what we want to uh, get to. If you're still afraid, educate yourself over a wide spectrum. Understand what's going on. Think critical of what things that you hear, question the things that you hear, boost your immune system and that of your loved ones, source good quality food, build up a connection with your local farmers and local health stores, say no, no acquiescence, Sub and that means you submit or comply silently without protest, agree or consent. Say no to small, seemingly unimportant injustices and ways others want to control you. Fight the small battles, then the bigger battles are easier as you are a more experienced soldier. The fight is really for your children's minds though. Know what they learn at school, page through their books, show them we can and may soon have to live without the amazing, all-seeing tracking technology that we all come to love so much. Support people and organizations that challenge and want to change the status quo and really help us. These are people like on YouTube, Double Odez, Jared Pitzer, Move One Million, Agenda 21, that is Justice Killian, the Liberty Fighters, and get involved. Don't acquiesce. Change the lockdown. Challenge it. Challenge the mosques, challenge the inconsistencies, the corruption. Support enterprises that open during the lockdown and buy local from small businesses. Support the hospitality industries and the entertainment industries. And then, of course, most of all, become self-sufficient. So you will have to reinvent yourself. Mark Twain once said, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, pause and evaluate.